Well, good morning, Walden Church. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor here. And I hope that from you being here and from watching uh, online these past couple of weeks, that you've come away with the fact that the Bible is important. It's the story of God, and it is the Word of God. And like we saw last week, it's been preserved, it's been protected, it's been defended for generations. But the bigger impact, influence, and power of the Bible is so much more demonstrated when it's lived out through the lives of those who read it. So yes, let's read it, let's know it, let's memorize it, let's pray through it, let's sing through it, let's read it even more, but let's also make sure that we obey it and that those words are lived out in us. So we've looked at how to read the Bible, how to trust the Bible, and I wanna close this morning with how to live out the Bible. Colossians chapter three, starting at verse 15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Notice there in verse 16, the Bible says, let the message of Christ dwell in you richly. This image is that the Bible is inside of us, you know, integrated with us, living with us. I've mentioned for the past couple weeks that the Bible should be like food. It should be inside of us, it should nourish us, it should help us grow. But, and, and when it's not in my life, then I should hunger for it. I should recognize its absence. So how do we then live out the Bible? How do we make it a part of our life? How do we do like the scripture says and, and allow the message to dwell in us? Well, I believe the answer to that question lies right here in Colossians chapter three. You know, our, our first week together, I said that we, when we read a passage, we should always read it in context. So shouldn't be surprising that the answer is gonna be right in front of us. The next verse, after it says, let the message of Christ dwell in you richly, verse 17 says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul says quite plainly, it's your whole life, right? He says the things you say, the things you do, the whole ball of wax, your life should all be for Jesus. I have a cup of coffee right here. Probably, uh, you probably have one too. Mm. Now, you might not be a coffee drinker. I don't know. Maybe you're the kind of person who doesn't drink coffee. You say, I don't drink coffee. I don't like the taste. Okay. Um, to that, I would argue that coffee is mostly water. It's mostly water. I mean, don't you like water? You like water, right? And, and the way the coffee is made, the water just passes through the coffee grounds and then it comes uh, out the strainer with the flavor, that beautiful flavor of coffee beans. Mm. Ah, a good cup of coffee is 98.75% water. Yeah, almost 99% water. And it's 1.25% uh, soluble plant matter. But to somebody who doesn't drink coffee, that 1.25% is all it takes <laughs> to make it go from water to coffee. Even though it's such a small percent that the coffee beans have changed and transformed the water into something else, it doesn't matter. It still now is coffee. It is no longer water. In fact, it's now impossible to remove the 1.25%. The, the water will never be water again, right? The water and the leaves are integrated together. And now we have 
a new creation. You know what integration is? It's the opposite of segregation. Segregation means you separate into groups, you divide. When you segment your life, then you are saying that you live a segregated life. When you take the pieces of the pie and you say, this is my personal life, this is my church life, this is my home life, this is my business life, this is my love life, this is my social life, what you're doing is you are segmenting your life. And then you live a segregated life. And from a very literal sense, if you live a segregated life, then by default, you are admitting that your life lacks integrity. Because integrity comes from the same word, integrated, right? To have integrity means that your life is whole. It's complete, like coffee. A life of integrity means that you don't act one way with one group of people over here and then act another way with a separate group of people over there. You don't act differently at home than you do at church. You don't act differently at work than you do at home. A, a life of integrity says that you walk the same way in every area of your life. So how do we live? Psalm 119, 20, David says, my soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. David says, my soul is consumed. Those are really over the top words, right? It means this is my number one priority in my life. It's the thing that he wants the most of all. It's the first thing he thinks of when he wakes up. It's the last thing he thinks about before he goes to bed. He says, my soul is consumed with what? Longing. Longing is about time. We, we long for something day after day. It takes over our thoughts. We dream about it, right? We, we reminisce all about it. And David says in every way, every day, he's consumed for what? Your rules. In other words, the law, God's word. David is writing and he says, I want to be a person of God's word everywhere. I want to live out your word. I want to breathe out your word. I want to live an integrated life with your word. Today, and we talk about our spiritual life as if it's all compartmentalized. Everything has a place. And so our spiritual life has a place. And it's, it's got its own label. It's got its own box. And this is a very Western idea to keep everything isolated and separated. But to a Hebrew living in the time of Jesus, that concept would have made absolutely no sense. Can you imagine somebody walking up to Jesus and saying, hey, Jesus, how's your spiritual life? It sounds ridiculous, right? In fact, no Jewish person who lived back then could have answered that question. Because in order to label one part of your life as spiritual, you then have to label another part of your life as not spiritual. And if that's the case, then what areas of your life are you not allowing the spirit into? Maybe the reason why we feel conflict in our life, and maybe the reason why we feel divided and broken is because we do it to ourselves. We feel broken, and it feels unnatural to us because God did not create us to be that way. God did not make you a segregated being. In fact, he actually made you a fusion between two different realms. If you look at Genesis 2, it says, the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And we see here that Adam is comprised of two elements. He's, he's dirt man, right? And that's why we call him Adam. Adam in, in Hebrew, Adama, means dirt. And basically, that's what we are. We are Adama. We are clay made. We are dirt people. But unlike anything that God had made previously, Adam, humanity, is unique because here is the world's first hybrid, right? We're the world's first hybrid. The Bible says that Adam is material, he's dust, but then he's also spiritual. He's breath. Maybe you've ever uh, come across someone 
and they've said, yeah, I'm not really, in, I'm not really into that. You know, I don't go to church. I'm not, a, I'm not a spiritual person. Really? You're not a spiritual person. Can you breathe? <laughs> Do you have breath? Are you alive? Then, then it's too late. You're spiritual. You are an integrated being all of your life. So, so think about all the boxes that you've put your life into. Money, relationship, taxes, uh, government, recreation, family, business, all of life is supposed to be intermixed. You are supposed to be integrated with the spiritual. Colossians 3 reminds us, it says, whatever you do in word or deed, do what? Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Notice, word or deed, do everything. How? In Christ. Every act of ours is spiritual. We are spiritual people. Jesus says in Matthew 25, whatever you do for the least of these, you do to me. Again, it's, it's every interaction you have. Your interactions at work, your interactions at home, your interactions at church, your interactions at play. Whatever you do, God is present in that moment. All of life, right? Every email you send is integrated with God. And why shouldn't it be? All of this, it's all his. We live in his world. And, and I know I began with this question, how do I live out the Bible, right? How do I live out the Bible? But the truth is, you can't help but live out the Bible. You can't help it. God is present in this moment. You are living the Bible right now. Your life is already integrated. Your life is already an application of the things that you believe. What you say, how you act, it's all based on how the Bible is integrated into your life. This is, this is all part of the story. But you could say, but I want more of this. I want more of the Bible. I want, to be, I want to be like David. I want to say, my soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. How do I get there? Perhaps, perhaps my life is integrated, but how do I get it to be even more integrated? Well, perhaps, like coffee, right? We recognize that life has flavor, right? Mm. Life has flavor, but some of us like it bold, right? You like coffee? You like coffee when it's bold? Some of us coffee drinkers, most of us don't like weak, bland, flavorless coffee. When I make coffee in the morning, I always use giant overflowing scoops. And then on the machine, I always push the bold button. If I'm gonna get serious about living out the Bible, how do I take what I'm doing now and move it into that deep, heaping scoops, bold way of life? Well, I'd offer that we can always look to Jesus as our example. After all, he modeled for us what it looks like to live an integrated life. Jesus was a man of the Bible. In fact, much of what Jesus said and did came directly from the Old Testament. Even his miracles, almost every single one of his miracles, was a reenactment from something in the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus lived a life, both in word and deed, that was integrated with scripture. So, Starting next week, we're going to uh, begin looking at the life of Jesus, and we're going to go from next week all the way to Easter. We've done, you know, a Christmas series before. Well, we're going to do an Easter series. And I thought, you know what, Let's, what better way to start than to start right here, right now, with Jesus' time in the desert. You know, before he begins his ministry, there's a time where he goes off by himself to, to meditate, to prepare himself. He goes off to the desert. And uh, it's kind of like the, the prequel <laughs> to his ministry. But, but even more than that, this is a great story. This is a great lesson about how Scripture can be integrated with your life. So this is a great place to begin for us. Notice in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus begins his ministry 
and he's spending some time in meditation, and it says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting, that means going without food, for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came, so, so the devil comes, right, and says to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus has removed himself from society for a little while. He's reflecting, he's preparing himself. He goes through 40 days, he fasts. And then the Bible says he felt physical hunger, of course. So in the middle of that weakness that he's feeling, that's when temptation comes. Did the devil come when Jesus was strong? No. Did he come when Jesus was at the top of his game? No. When does the devil come? During a moment of weakness. The devil comes when your guard is down. The devil comes when you're distracted by other things, when you're susceptible. And the devil says, hey, if you're hungry, you know, you can always perform a miracle and uh, you can make food out of thin air. And technically, that's true. But how does Jesus respond? He responds by quoting Deuteronomy 8, chapter 3. Tell me something. How is Jesus able to do that? He just conjures up right there the right verse at the right time. Was it because Jesus was magic? No, because Jesus had an integrated life with the scriptures. When he faced temptation, when he faced a problem, his first reaction, his first impulse is to fight back Fight back against temptation with the Word of God. Don't kid yourself. When darkness comes to you, when temptation comes to you, anything in life that comes after you, and it's an attack on you, anything that has set to rip you apart, or maybe just evil is going to come and just poke holes at you, don't think that that's going to happen when you're at the top of your game. Temptation doesn't come when you're reading the Bible or studying the Bible. It happens later when your Bible is somewhere else. And what Jesus says is important. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And when you and I, when we think about bread, we think of it as being food, yes, but it being a staple food, right? This is, this is a basic. This is a building block. These are, these are nutrients. These are essentials. And so here the Bible is linked to spiritual food. It's water. It's milk. It's bread. It's the meat. It's life. Jesus tells the devil, I don't, I don't just need food to live. Jesus says, I also need the word of God. And so if the Bible is just as important as food, then we should be feeding ourselves with it. Jesus knows Deuteronomy 8, chapter 3, because he was fed with it. It was in him. He learned it. He meditated on it. Much the same way physical food gives us physical strength, spiritual food gives us spiritual strength. But unlike regular food, when I feed on the Bible, in other words, the more I take it in, the hungrier I actually get. At the same time that the Bible satisfies me, it also makes me hungry for more. Psalm 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, the more I taste and see how good the Lord is, the more I want that sweetness inside of me, the more I want that word, that milk, that 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 biblical meat inside of me, I, the, I, I hunger more for it. So I need to be continually feeding myself on the word of God. Colossians 3 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It lives in us like food in our stomach. Richly, meaning healthily, right? Bigly, wide, bellyly, top pants, button offly. I'm wearing sweatpants when I come to dinnerly. Right? That's how much Bible I need. 
when the, when the, wherever the Bible is concerned, there's, there's no such thing as overeating or stuffing yourself. Let it, let it dwell in you. Let it move into you. Let it inhabit you. Let it take up residence in you. Let it be rich and profound and, and give you life. That's what this verse is saying. All right, let's go back. Let's go back to the desert. Verse 5 in Matthew 4. Then the devil took Jesus to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And... On their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. What's, what's happening in this? Well, Jesus had used the Bible to defend himself. And now, Satan is using the Bible back at him. He said, oh yeah, I know Bible verses too. You see, that's the truth. It, it's, it's not just that you know the words of the Bible, but we know them well enough that we use them correctly right? Because the Word of God is not only food for your soul, the Word of God is also a standard for how we live. It's the Word of God, and it sets the standard, and it helps us evaluate life. We measure life up against the Word. We evaluate the world up against the Word. It, 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 should, it should help us with the things that we face in life. Because just like we said last week, Something has to become the authority in your life. Something has to be the bar. Something has to be the standard. You've got to build your life on something. When you make decisions, you're going to have to base that on something. The Bible says in Psalm 1, blessed is the one who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, but who meditates on the word of God, right? What, what, is that, what does that mean? It means you want your life to be blessed, right? So you don't build your life on the counsel of the world or on the way the world thinks. Don't meditate on those things. What you want to do is you want to meditate on, you want to think upon and build your life upon the way God thinks. That's right. The counsel of the ungodly that the Bible is talking about, that's all the stuff that we hear every single day. That's all the stuff, that's all the popular sayings and the things that are going around. That's, that's the tempter, okay? That's the devil. It, it's the talk that's going on in the world around us. It's the values of the world. And the Bible says, no, if you want your life to be blessed, you don't build your life on that kind of counsel, but you live your life, you build your life, you feed your life on what? The Word of God. Psalm 1, Psalm 119, 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. That's what the devil wants here in the story. He wants Jesus to sin. So he twists the scriptures into a test. The psalmist says, if you want to combat that, then you need to hide the word away in your heart. That's, that's memorizing, right? You'd be memorizing the scripture. It's, it's hidden away. It's now hidden in your brain. It's hidden in your heart. He says, I've hidden your word in my heart. I'm not doing that to be a goody two-shoes Christian. I'm not doing that to show off and just spout off Bible verses in front of my friends to impress them. No. Jesus is being tempted, and he's in a moment of weakness, and then he uses the word correctly to come to his defense. And it's scripture that he's memorized, and he does it again. It says the devil took Jesus to the holy city. He says, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest your foot strike against a stone. That's the Bible. And now watch how Jesus responds. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. What does that mean? It means, yes, I, I, I feed on the word. I hide it away in my heart. I trust it like we talked about you know, last week, the importance of trusting the Bible, but I also use it as my guide. Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. People are in the dark. You've been in the dark. Do you ever feel like you don't have the slightest idea what you're supposed to do? Don't know if you should go left or right? Don't know what choice to make? Well, what do you do when you're in the dark? 
You need to turn on the light. That verse is a promise from God. The next time you're in the dark, the next time you're confused, you don't know which way to go, you don't know what to do, you, you, you just pray. God, you said in Psalm 119 that your word would be a light to my feet and a lamp to my path. God, show me the path to walk on. Lead me out of this darkness. Verse 8 says, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So lastly, the tempter tells Jesus flat out to betray God, to break the first and greatest commandment, which is to love God and to worship him, obey him only. And again, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy. After all, God is the foundation of faith, and Jesus trusts and loves and obeys that foundation. So why would he betray the thing upon which he stands. And, and, and think about something that becomes a foundation for you, or maybe a foundation you've seen. You know, when they, when they build a new house in our community, the first thing they do is they lay down that cement block. And however wide and strong that foundation is, that's going to determine the building that gets built on top of it. So for me, if I'm going to build my life on the Bible, and I'm going to build my life on God's word, and that's going to be my foundation, then it's going to be the structure, it's going to be the support for everything else in my life. This is why Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Building your life on the rock of truth. Because truth doesn't change. People who say, oh, well, that's just true for you. That's just your reality. That's just truth how you see it. That is not true. Truth doesn't change. Truth is the standard. It is the rock. Opinions change. Truth doesn't change. If it was true a thousand years ago, it'll be true a thousand years from now. And if you build your life on the rock, if you build your life on God's word, then you're going to build on the stability of something that never changes. How? How do I get that bold richness? How do I live out the Bible even more? I feed on the Word, right? We talked about that. I feed on the Word. I hide it away in my heart. I memorize it. I trust it. And I build on it. All the things we talked about. Living an integrated life with Scripture. I feed on it. I hide it away in my heart. I trust it, and I build on it. Real quick, I have just two more suggestions. One, I would say pray before reading. Pray before reading. There's lots of wonderful things in the Bible, but you won't be able to see them oftentimes if God doesn't open your eyes to see them. And, and being open to seeing them means that you're going to be receptive. I've got to open the Word of God so that I become a person of the Word, but even after it's open, I have to be receptive to it. That means even if I don't like it, I'm open to it. I'm going to listen to it. Psalm 119 says, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. The Bible is full of wonderful things. And so before we begin reading, we ask God, just open my eyes to it. Help me to become receptive to it. May I see the things, may I read the things that you want me to see and hear. So read, pray before reading. And number two, obey after reading. Pray before reading, obey after reading. James 1.22 says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. If I go to church and it's just going in one ear and then out the other ear, then I have only listened to it. James says, that's you lying to yourself. The tempter will come, the devil will come and say to you, hey, you spent 30 minutes in church. You did your job. You're a Christian. You're fine. You can go home. Go back to living the life that you had lived before. That's not how it works. That's why when you go to school, your teacher doesn't just count 
your classwork as learning. Your teacher gave you something else. What did your teacher give you? Homework, right? Application. You learning to do it on your own. You obeying the word on your own. Sure, you sat in church, you sat still for 30 minutes. You took notes, great. But you don't learn it until you obey it, okay? D.L. Moody said the Bible wasn't given to increase our knowledge. The Bible was given to change our lives. And the bottom line is, I only believe the parts of the Bible that I actually do. If you don't forgive your enemies, then you don't believe that part of the Bible. If you don't turn the other cheek, then you don't believe it. If you don't pray for your enemies and those who persecute you, you don't really believe it. If you don't forgive as Christ has forgiven you, you don't believe it. If you wanna know how much of the Bible is integrated into your life, then I would ask you how much of the Bible has changed you. That's the best way to see how influential the Bible is in you. How much has it changed you? You know, the, the critics that lived back then, the, the scribes, the Pharisees that lived of Jesus' day, and even the, even the devil, right? They knew all the words. They knew all the words of the Bible too. But Jesus was different because he lived a whole and integrated with life with the Bible. The words were in him. And he allowed those words to shape how he acted and how he lived. I, I pray that the Bible becomes something that lives in you, something that transforms you, something that grows you. And ultimately, the Bible becomes something that leaps off of the page and becomes your life. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this book once again. We thank you for the Bible, not just because it helps pastors craft inspirational sermons, and not just because we can put a Bible verse in front of a picture of a sunset and think about how nice it makes us feel. Lord, the Bible should be something that changes our lives, something that stretches us and grows us. Your word says that, that it even cuts us that it creates division in us. Lord, if we are too comfortable with our Bible reading, make us uncomfortable. If our belly is too empty of your spiritual food, give us hunger pains. Cause us to go back to that book, to open it, to become one with it, to have its words and pages and, and its teaching become integrated in our life. Lord, there's nothing I want more. There's no other truth in this world but your truth. There's no other king that I should follow but your king. Lord, if I know the gospel, if I know the core story of God's love of this book, then may it not just be head knowledge for me, but may it come across in my actions. May I share God's love. May I share God's story, the story of how Jesus was sent, he was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, that he taught us what grace and forgiveness look like, and that he died in our place for our sins and was resurrected three days later, and that he now sits at your right hand, Lord, that story, that amazing story, that story integrated with my own testimony, with the story of my own life, and how I've seen God move in my life, Lord, that is all I need. That I can take this Bible, that I can take this book to my next door neighbor, to my friends at work, to the end of my street, to the end of my state, to the far reaches of the world, and share that story, share that gospel. Because for just as much as the Bible changes me, the Bible needs to continue to change the world to change my neighbor and to reach out across walls, across barriers, and to touch darkness and shared light where darkness hides. May your word continue to make more Christians and to make better Christians. And may your church 
be its hands and feet. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching with us this morning. Of course, you're probably listening to an MP3 or you're watching this uh, on YouTube. You can always clip and copy the URL at the top and share it on your page, share it on your wall so that other people can see uh, what you learned today, or you can post it to a friend's wall if you think they might benefit from it. I love you guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.